Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Hope we are all well tonight. Hello. Hey, Talisha. How are you? just joined. We am live. All righty then. Hope everyone is doing well today. We are live officially on Facebook. Ooh, but my, there you go. Yeah, I, I don't know. The collar is just not doing what it's supposed to be doing tonight, but that's okay. Um, We're going to roll with it anyway. Hello, Eric. Hey, Tree. How you doing? Hey, Talisha. How you doing? Hey, Eric. Good. We're doing well. So we'll just give uh, people another minute or so. Uh, in the meantime, we are live on Facebook. So why don't we just start off with saying, you know, how are things going? What's going on with our weeks? And you have a couple of people in the chat as well. Tell us how, how are things going with your weeks? Your week, uh, I guess I should say. <laughs> I mean, look, let's, let's deal with the elephant in the room. The okay. elephant in the room right now <laughs> is we have uh, the Bitcoin price is just like going parabolic. So what's happening with Bitcoin? I haven't even been keeping up with it. PayPal oh, announced we today. Yeah, so. PayPal did yeah. what? PayPal announced that they will allow uh, cryptocurrency transactions through it today so that's okay you get because i i feel like they had been teetering with that anyway this this isn't like um, but no this is it's significant in the sense but mm -hmm. i think there's a caveat as always uh-huh yes. it's not an exchange as i keep telling people all day long it's not an exchange so you have to be very cautious with using it in the sense that it is a centralized database Mm -hmm. It is not an exchange or a blockchain. So mm -hmm. now we have these transactions happening, um, you know, buying and selling, but at the same time, they're really used for, you know, consumerism. They're trying to let you buy something more so than exchange uh, because they don't have that really that strong functionality. So that's coming, but it's just the announcement itself. People read a headline and they just lose control. Mm -hmm. So what, what's what's the price right now? Does anyone know? Um, I mean, I checked it a minute ago. A minute ago, we had hit 13, 13, 13 two. 13, yeah, it was up there. Hmm. So now it's at twelve thousand eight hundred. But but Talisha's point is is exactly right, and you do have to read the fine print. And for what I read, Talisha is you can't withdraw any nope. of your any of your crypto from out of the PayPal. System. Correct, because again, oh, well, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, because they're not an exchange. I think that's the key when you asked where and what it mm -hmm. can happen. You can buy it, but it has to be in your wallet. It has to stay there. It is now in their ecosystem and with no way of coming out besides being a consumer. Right. So you have to. Well, it's not even in your wallet. It's in PayPal's wallet. 
Mm-hmm. Well, it, yeah, it, it's mm-hmm. truly yours, right? You don't even own the key. You don't own. You don't own the key. That's what I was saying. It's not yeah. like your hard wallet. Yeah. yeah. So this is very, uh, you know, again, just coming on the heels, and then yesterday, the Bahamas released their, you know, digital currency. Mm-hmm. They're the first yeah. country to do so. Um, this was slated, and so three hundred ninety-three thousand individuals get to have an e-wallet and mm-hmm. use this this currency. Again, mm-hmm. it's a digital asset. I've been talking to people all day about these two things. I get, I mean, mm-hmm. my, my messenger has been blowing up. Like, what does this mean? I'm like, it just means that it's digital currency because it's minted. It mm-hmm. is not mined. So that's again, very much. This is why the definitions of how things work are really, really important because we can slide into thinking that it's something that it really isn't. Right. I need, give me a second guys. Hold on. Yeah, it's, it's climbing. It's still, it's, it's going up. Mm-hmm. You know, I will say though, Felicia, what is interesting, even when we look at what happened in the Bahamas, is um, this is what's key. I think that when, when people start seeing things like that, is the fact that now uh, for them, that means that there is an, um, there's an acclimation of the greater population there mm-hmm. to digital currency. And also the infrastructure there has to be now created now for people to actually hold wallets. And then you look at that and like, yeah, and absolutely it's a, it's a centralized currency, uh, government you know, tracks all your spending, they can probably shut down your wallet, all that sort of stuff is happening. But it does bring people into a greater understanding, similar to the internet, where before it becomes, okay, no, I know how to use it now. I, you know, and that sort of thing, where now you start looking at the adoption curve, mm-hmm. uh, things like you that. You have to have an infrastructure. And I think that's where it is. If it's going to have to be centralized, then that's where it's going to have to be. But this also means that the nation itself can operate very differently. So it okay. can have two different protocols. And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago with the digitization of something, you have different availability of cash flows that you didn't have if you just have regular fiat currency in the bank. So now they've given themselves this uh, ability to kind of traverse a new system and also give themselves some trading capabilities that may or may not happen at large because we know like Estonia is that kind of country that has this kind of system already in place as well. You know, just little things that kind of creep in here Mm -hmm. that now we'll be seeing. But I think it's very interesting that a Caribbean nation was the first to come out and do it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Kudos to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there have been parts of other countries that have done it. For example, I know there was a, um, a place in Kenya where, you know, certain merchants had their own digital currency and digital economy. Um, but it, it doesn't surprise me that a smaller country would do it and a smaller, I'm going to mm-hmm. call it here in the visionary country, right, mm-hmm. uh, would, would do it. And I just pulled this up for everybody because we always talk about the tech um, adoption curve. We haven't brought this specific graphic up in, in several months, but I did want to bring it up because everything we're looking at is, okay, the money is made from a a blockchain point of view, when this early majority starts getting in. Mm -hmm. And I I think that we as blockchain consultants need to be very hypervigilant with regards to when the early majority comes in. The other thing I think is that dependent on the industry and the use case, these are gonna be different. So, you know, a use case, for example, for um, supply chain or governance, you know, or digital identity is going to be different than digital currencies and some of the other things that we're talking about. So I wanted to throw that out there to the two of you as well. And anybody else in the, um, in the audience that wants to respond to that? I think there's an overlay. So right here, this curve will stay there. And then we'll have an infrastructure overlay and an application Mm -hmm. adoption overlay, which Mm -hmm. will still parallel itself. But at that point, that's where it gets into the, I would say the nitty gritty because the adoption of applications are always much more simplistic, but you have to have the infrastructure. So at some point you're either going to have to merge with someone, partner with somebody if you are only using the application. But for example, Bahamas, 
they have been working obviously on their infrastructure to make this work. Mm -hmm. So now they not only have the infrastructure, they have the application. So they are a use case oh. unto themselves, kind of just working through this whole thing. So they're gonna have a lot of data coming out of that country oh, yeah. with regard to how this works. So I think that's a really, again, just a very interesting um, time for them. And again, that they are a Caribbean nation, small enough to have it, like I said, 393,000 individuals have that access. But at this point, we're gonna see a large, you know, they, again, they're just gonna have a lot of data available to them to make some decisions. And they're gonna be the leaders and forefront runners of what we're gonna be seeing, like how to do it and why, and you know, um, if it's gonna be a success, what, what transitions are gonna be made, all of that is gonna come out of them. I agree. Um, you know, and, and it's funny, you know, looking at it, I, I actually think that we're right in, I think we're still in the early adopters phase, you know, right now. I don't, you know, we haven't, we haven't crossed into, I mean, like we're definitely not there with the, with the early majority, but um, I do feel that, you know, kind of Talisha, when I, when I start looking at, you know, countries like that, it's just me. I would love to see them even take even further aggressive steps. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes down to blockchain ad adoption, cryptocurrency, um, well, you know, that's much different than a centralized digital currency, but I would, I would love to see them even be, even be more progressive um, in that sense, because they are dealing with a smaller um, population and they can be, um, to me, just more aggressive in that point. So I would, I would love to see it. I think that- Yeah, I, I don't know what's on their roadmap, but it, it's definitely, yeah. I mean, they, they are laying the structure for it now. So I said, like so I'm saying, you can't okay. just jump into this. <laughs> so that's why these countries that are really putting forth the energy and the effort to even go through this, what I consider an exercise in digitization are going to have much more understanding of how things work yes. because they're testing and learning right now so exactly. they're not going to be like oh let's see for a little bit if you're letting you know your whole nation <laughs> go through this process with you yes mm -hmm. there's going to be bumps yes there's going to be some you know some hardships and some obstacles but what you're testing and learning right now is going to set the tone for the rest of the, the nations that come along like everybody's going to have to do this so why mm -hmm. not in the forefront setting that tone and seeing what you can do. And I said, if it starts with that centralization, that's great. But the minute that they can say, oh, okay, now let's add cryptocurrency to it, they have the right. infrastructure to flip a switch and now do it. Right, totally. So um, <clears throat> I, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I believe that the Bahamas is one of the places that focuses on um, being a, a safe haven, I know Bermuda is one as well, safe haven for, mm -hmm. yeah. for financial um, mm -hmm. multinational corporations. So one of the things I was thinking of is them being ahead of the curve with regards to this because you know the original Bitcoin was always thought to be a, a, a financial transaction play. Um, the other thing is um, I believe that Many of the people in our audience are familiar with uh, the 10K Project, and I've been doing a daily podcast called Black Money Daily. And today I did a story about the fact that global economists believe that 85 million jobs are going to be lost due to COVID and the acceleration of technology because of it. However, 90 something million jobs are going to replace it. And I even got a call from a gentleman who, um, without going into too much detail, it's from a business plan business, but he's working on getting a grant for the Virgin Islands um, to get more internet in certain areas of the Virgin Islands, where right now they're only a 20 something percent and they're trying to get it up to 40%. So what we're seeing is the globalization of labor is the point that I'm getting to. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the Bahamas could be making a play for a lot of those 90 something million jobs that are going to be coming through the blockchain and due to um, increases in technology, just like China, you know, was and made a play for uh, certain types of jobs, you know, 50 years ago. Um, 
I'm interested in hearing which, what your thoughts are with regards to that. Because actually tonight's topic is very interesting because we were talking about marginali marginalized economies mm -hmm. uh, and the blockchain and this kind of really goes into it with what the Bahamas is doing. I think it leads directly into that because again, you're making an infrastructure that affords a whole host of international trade. You don't have to worry about the currency exchange at this point if we go into again a cryptocurrency space but if we're even trying to leverage their digital asset that again gives them another play in a different manner so i think different countries are going to come and say okay for this exchange of labor or you know we can do this we will come to your country for the digital asset aspect if you let us build and so i think it's a really interesting domino effect once you move into the space, now you have options that you just didn't have with a currency that didn't play well in the global right. space. But the minute you put it in the digital space, it's a, it's a totally different world. Like it truly is a totally different world. So that- I Especially think, if you're one of the first ones too. Right. You know, yeah. come late setting the tone. I think right. that's what's happening. And then right. you have to, again, it's already a money haven. <laughs> it was already mm -hmm. that in the mm -hmm. beginning. But I think, again, people are going to see how that's going to, again, give them different revenue streams or different allocations of, of their assets, uh, whether it's cash or whatever they put into that, those systems now. So they're just going to be, I think, inundated with other individuals saying, hey, how can we take part? They're going to get a lot of inquisitions of like, hey, mm -hmm. how can we be a part of this? What are you guys doing? How are you mm -hmm. doing it? Can mm -hmm. we piggyback? Yeah. So they're just, they're bolstering their own. And again, I think it's going to be outside of their country, giving them much more magnitude. And definitely people are going to now be looking at what they do right. um, very, very closely. Well, I know that they're, um, I don't know if CARICOM is the right term, but there's this uh, uh, association similar to NAFTA for the Caribbean countries. So mm -hmm. it wouldn't surprise me, you know, we, we talked about the Bahamas, but if Bermuda and and Dominican Republic and some of those other um, islands come together mm -hmm. and, uh, and do some work there. And in, in fact, in the article that we're gonna talk about tonight, they also mentioned Haiti and some of the work that is happening within blockchain and agricultural uh, community within Haiti as well. Mm -hmm. So um, why don't we jump into the articles of the day and I'm sure that it'll all, all blend together it always uh, does. <laughs> at the end, uh, as well. It always does. Exactly. And first of all, if anyone's new here, welcome to Black Blockchain Consultants. We talk about the business of blockchain. So we focus on how to make money in this $3.1 trillion industry. Whether you want to get a job, you want to start a blockchain based business, you want to invest in a blockchain project whether you're investing time or money in that project and ultimately, again, participate in the $3.1 trillion economy that is coming. We talk about it all here from our point of view. So I usually do a couple of articles. Uh, I've got Eric here, I've got Talisha here, and we're just gonna jump right in and talk about either everyone's favorite topic or least favorite topic, which is the election. <laughs> Oh my goodness. We're talking about the result. We're not talking about the election. We're talking about the data. We're, 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 talking, we're talking about blockchain and the election. That's it. <laughs> the use of the blockchain tech and the election. And Chainlink has a new product that is going to track U.S. election results on the chain. So in a press release with the Associated Press and blockchain company Everpedia, announced, uh, they announced their new partnership. Um, the goal will be to use a new product that leverages Chainlink to publish U.S. election results on the chain. The partners emphasize the need to help create verifiable sources of income. According to the statement, uh, the Associated Press has been part of the U.S. election process since 1848 at a national level. This year, they will be charged with declaring a winner in seven thousand contests. Those results will go into Everpedia's product to reliably transmit the information using Chainlink's Oracle infrastructure. AP will quote unquote sing the data cryptographically 
So we have to ask you what that means. I have it's no sign. Clue. It's just a it's a typo. It's sign. It oh, it's sign. I was like, what the yeah. hell is singing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's a real word. So singing to the data. <laughs> I don't even highlight like that because I'm like, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that makes more sense that AP will sign the data cryptographically and broadcast the key on Everpedia's official channel according to the release. The product de developed by Everpedia is an Oracle as a service platform called Everpedia Oracle. Um, it has been created to solve the problem of oracles in the blockchain. Therefore, it offers its users sources cryptographically signed by worldwide organizations according to the statement. The platform will run on Chainlink's Oracle service. Everpedia's product uses cryptographic attestations made by verified entities so that the information can be processed directly to the blockchain and used in smart contracts. Everpedia offers a profit to organizations that contribute with specific topics that range from elections, sports, weather, world events, among others. Um, and then this guy said something here and that's the end of the article. So I'm gonna keep it here because I do have a comment about this last sentence here, but I'll toss it over. Um, they're singing on, on the blockchain cryptographically as you can tell. And um, what do we think of, of this uh, in terms of, <clears throat> I believe this is kind of like the beginning, you know? Um, oh, yes, 100, 100, you know, let me just say, because Talisha's used the word like multiple times, she's talked about infrastructure. And this is why I love this space of blockchain, crypto, digital um, currency, just because it's, it's, under, it's underdeveloped. And what I mean by underdeveloped is, the infrastructure is being built. All the roads and all the bridges and all the plumbing and all the power lines are being created. So that's why whenever you see um, new developments and new blockchain um, iterations that are, that are created, they're looking to solve a problem within it that will make it even that much more, um, I guess you would say, applicable, useful within the real world. And Chainlink, completely like falls right in that line of a decentralized oracle uh, where you can have a trusted data feed to get information from the real world into the blockchain itself so this and and you know we we know just there's always been a big issue of, of voting and how much can you trust it and, and then we see issues right now where um, I have a voting office it's not too far for me, but man, that like the line is like incredible, you know, at all times of the day and night, I'm probably pretty sure everyone else is kind of seeing the same thing, mm -hmm. but there's issues too when people talk about paper voting and, and paper ballots and issues there. So we are moving to a point where I do believe that eventually that entire process is going to be digitized, but you, we will also need to have it. So um, the results that we have, we will completely have to believe and to know that that has been trusted and verified. Yeah. And this is setting this up for that. Talisha? Definitely Oracle as a service is a, a really great topic um, for, again, people who are new here. Blockchains and smart contracts don't you know, access the information. They, they don't store the information, so they have mm -hmm. to get it from a trusted source to be able to process it. And subsequently, this Oracle um, is a very unique tool in the sense that it's not only, you know, verifying the information, it's aggregating the information, making sure that it comes in the same way and can actually be read, you know, concurrently to whatever system. And that's where Chainlink comes in, where it's able to not only pull that information in, making sure that it goes directly to this, uh, to the blockchain that is required and subsequently processed by those smart contracts that are sitting on it. I think this is going to be a highly contested race. So anything that leads to its validity of the results are going to need to be in place. Like we're not going to trust too many sources at this point. And even though this is a new one, at least there is, there's data proof. At this point, you'll be able to see it. As I said, they're sending the keys directly to it. You'll be able to see the transactions almost in real time if, it, mm -hmm. if they could show it to us in that manner. Mm -hmm. So this, is, this will, I think, 
save some of the information from, you know, having, I think the contention is going to be there. There's going to be some argument about it, but at least this will be a viable source to kind of point to and say, this is how we got the number. It's not just some fabricated number that came up from somewhere else. See, I'm not so certain that um, the presidential election is going to go through here. When they said 7,000, I honestly thought local and yeah. state raises, um, personally. Yeah, um, there, there will definitely be some others. I mean, this is the federal because Utah just did it. So Utah also, I uh, have actually posted in the uh, Facebook group, Utah is now tracking the presidential election on its blockchain. Yeah, but that's again on a state level versus a, right. a national level. So everything that's happening now is being tested. Now, I believe for years from now, it's going to be a different topic, right? Mm -hmm. Where uh, hopefully, I'm going to show this again, hopefully we'll be at a point where there will be early, early adoption of this and we will see it start going mainstream within politics and the election cycle. Um, the other thing that I thought was interesting is this sentence here. Everpedia offers a profit to organizations that contribute with specific topics that can range from elections, sports, weather, world events, among others. It seems to me like they are looking to be a data hub with like verifiable cryptographically signed data about all sorts of things. So when I think sports, I think every type of sport that's out there, you know, um, from college, football to uh, mm -hmm. soccer to softball, you know, Nigeria versus Germany, you know, all of that stuff. And a lot of that stuff is huge business and people will, um, I know within the esports world, I work with a business plan client where they were looking at doing something like this, being the verifiable, um, verifying, sorry, um, we call it scores at tournaments and things like that because people put all sorts of stuff on Twitter or whatever. So like having a, a central hub uh, for verifiable information. So I thought in terms of a, we talk about business models here. I thought in terms of business model, this is actually quite interesting. I don't know um, what other competitors they specifically have for this, but it, it's quite interesting what they are looking to um, well, Lane, they're looking to carve for themselves. This yeah, Everpedia. Blockchain ecosystem. So again, this is where tokenization can come in very much viable. The more mm -hmm. individuals that come into it are obviously given the tokens uh, for their participation. They're also going to be the aggregators and the, the verifiers. So mm -hmm. there's, again, different revenue streams that can be given just from actually pr the performance of you know, retrieving the score to you know, calculating the score. All of those things can actually happen here. And I think, again, once it's in this in integration format, you're going to see a lot more people participate because they don't have to worry about, you know, formatting the data, whatnot, the, the Oracle will do that for them. So they can just plug in. And that's what you're really looking for. Again, this is where we talk about the onboarding. This is very simple because all I do is give you the data. Right. I don't need to do anything else. Right. Eric? No, you know what, I was thinking about this and, and, you know, we've talked about on this channel multiple times that, you know, these technologies work as Lego pieces. That they're not, you know, always independent, but they're how they're all then stacked together and then they work and then you get that result. I'm, 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 I'm curious, what, do you think we'll get to the point that people won't even have to leave their houses at all, that they'll be able to go and verify that they are that person who's going to vote from their tablet, from their computer, from their phone. And I believe it. Do it yeah. 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 But I, I think I will, I personally think it's a ways off. Um, I do think that you have to, um, right now, with the political structure the way that it is, and I'm, I'm more of a fan of the business of politics than I am of politics itself. Um, but there are certain people who could not get elected in this country were it not for people ages 70 plus. <laughs> and until, you know, those people are out of power and that demographic is no longer able to vote, um, 
there are gonna be people who fight tooth and nail against people being able to verify themselves on a tablet. But once that happens, once that generation has, has gone and you know, you've got people like us who are 45, 50 years old, even 55 years old, and it's okay with us, then yeah, it'll, it, I think at that point, it'll be a lot more accepted. Yeah, I see it happening. Um, it, it, in, you know, we, we've talked to kind of about COVID itself and how it's kind of accelerated the adoption of certain things. Mm -hmm. And then we look at that, even at that, that disruption itself and how that's kind of played out here, you know, with the voting booths and people, you know, and, and not having to keep a certain amount of distance and all of those sort of things and how that's played out. But man, it kind of makes sense to say, hey, you know what, don't worry about it. You'll be at your house. You can do it. This is how you're going to mm -hmm. verify yourself. And we can just keep it pushing and want to worry about it. So, Yeah. You know. So let's move on then to our second article here, which is all about blockchain for good. And um, it's how blockchain is being used to transform the lives of people in marginalized communities. And I wanna say right now, this article is about refugees, but I'm gonna tie it in to natural disasters, especially with black people in the United States. So every time you see refugee, think Katrina, in New Orleans and swap it out, okay? Um, so a key aim of the building blocks of the project between the UN and the Building Blocks Initiative and Grassroots, they're talking about this here. So a key aim of the Building Blocks Project is to provide people in refugee camps with the means of buying food and necessities quickly and securely using direct cash transfers. Another objective is to ensure they no longer have to worry about food vouchers being lost or stolen or about third party organizations such as banks having access to their personal data. Direct cash transfers according to F R the WFP research are often the most effective and efficient way to distribute humanitarian assistance as well as support local economies but being able to distribute it relies on the support of local financial institutions, which are not always in a position to do so, not least because many refugees face restrictions in opening bank accounts. To try and address the situation, in early 2017, the WFP introduced a proof of concept blockchain based system to register and authenticate transactions in Sindh province, Pakistan, which did not require a bank, a bank to act as an intermediary to connect both parties. The system is now being used to support 106,000 Syrian refugees in the Azraq and Zatari camps in Jordan and 500,000 Rohingyas in the Cox's Bazaar camp in Bangladesh. As to how the system works, after registering with the UN High Commissioner of Refugees, people receive a virtual wallet containing $30, which is stored in a beneficiary account on a private Ethereum-based blockchain, so they can purchase goods at select retailers. At the checkout, an iris scan enables them to spend the money by authenticating their identity while the transaction is recorded using the blockchain. And then retailers are then reimbursed for the transaction by the WFP. So I wanted to stop there and get everyone's thoughts. Of course, again, there are Black refugees all over the, the world as well. Um, when I read this initially, I, I transferred, because um, I am originally from New Orleans, so I transferred what happened to Katrina um, with, uh, with this as well in order to kind of make this a little bit more uh, home, you know, for me in terms of a, a situation and a scenario, but I want to throw it out to everybody. What do you think about how this is being used to help marginalized communities? Go ahead, Eric. Uh, I, I hear the controversy. <laughs> well, here's my, here's my take on things like this. I, I absolutely appreciate uh, any effort for them to reach out and to help and to serve this community. I, at the same time, there are a couple things in this that draw, um, I do have some concern about. 
One is, okay, if you look at that paragraph, uh, as to how the system works after registering with the UN High Commission for Refugees, people receive a virtual wallet containing $30, which is stored in a beneficiary account on a private Ethereum based blockchain. Okay. I, 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 I get to the point where I, I understand what they're looking to do, but I'm, I'm pushing more of a sovereign digital identity that I want these people to, to own and to be, to, to own their own identity and not having to have another third party be in control of that, who could at any point be manipulated and shut it down, ended over a, a disagreement, like anything could happen. And I, I, I guess for me, that was one thing that I'm, I'm, I'm really concerned about. They also, at the checkout in Iris Scan, enables them to spend the money by authenticating their identity. Well, that's another thing. Okay, now who, who is holding that information? And, and, and this is all, and, and, and I'm always trending. And, and you know, you guys, we all do this. I'm always trending towards decentralization and the sovereign individual being in control of this. And I guess I look at that and I go, is that going to a centralized database? And then they're going to be the ones who hold that and have this, like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if, if anyone's ever been through um, certain airports. Um, I know LAX has it. Uh, have, have have you ever used Clear? Have you ever seen that? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, have you have you tried it, Felicia? Yep. Have you used it? Okay. Yes. So yeah, now now why didn't you try it? Like why didn't you use it? I, I just don't feel it's safe. Again, they can't tell me where the information Please. is stored for how long. They can't give me the requisite information, so I can't give them my information. See, and 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 that's it. And Clear uses an iris scan too, mm -hmm. right? So that's it. You go and you and you give them iris scan and then you can go instead of having to show your ID or whatever, you can just pass right on through the airport um, and get on your flight, you know, for that. But that's that's my issue with this is those things, um, those things just really stick out to me. So, you know. Yeah, so Alicia? I have a, just an overall issue with the setup. Again, these are great theoretical concepts but again, this is where the business and the tech don't match. Mm. So yes, we have the capacity to do these things, but without the proper infrastructure of the business aspect, this is not viable. This can be shut down, manipulated, used in, in very much a weaponized way. So this wouldn't work for me if I was the person saying, okay, this is the plan. I need zero proof protocols in here. I need a digital ID here. I need that, that, that database truly I need that to be truly eradicated like I need it to truly be a decentralized like I can't have it centralized for that purpose or it won't work for me um like those are just like the things I keep checking off like it doesn't meet <laughs> the requisite of what I think it should do from just a functionality perspective and again a lot of those things could be replaced if the minute that we would put the zero proof um zero knowledge proofs in here that would take care of half of it right there. Really? We wouldn't have to do the registration. We wouldn't have to do the single sign on ID. Everything could be, you know, just decentralized from there. And then there wouldn't even need to be the reimbursement of the, the vendors because there could be a transaction protocol from everything that participates. If I have the coin, you get the coin, it's done. I don't need it to be tracked. It just is a viable sense of currency. So those are those kind of things I think, again, we talk about it from that high level and it sounds nice, but then we have to go that little levels deeper and it's like, mm -hmm. this isn't going to work. Right. Yeah. Right. I didn't think about the data being weaponized, but I do, I do believe from a, a political point of view, they are also using this to track the refugees you exactly. know, and, and, and track what they're doing. And, and, you know, it, it's a highly political thing to talk about um, terrorism and, you know, being able to trace people and track people and things like that. So yes, this, this data is being used for multiple purposes. I want to go down to, um, a stat that they had though down here, um, here over the last seven years, such activity has generated $1.5 million in local trade, uh, creating 17% more jobs across the country in the process 
boosting school attendance by 23%, enhancing food security by 78%, and cutting crime and corruption by 25%. So when I read this, it kind of got me like thinking, okay, you know, this is helping in some sort of way. I don't know if we can put the full decentralized, you know, um, process onto a, a highly politicized refugee situation. I will tell you when um, I had an uncle who was in the Superdome for Katrina and it was a horrible experience. And mm -hmm. he only told me half of what happened there. Um, but one of the things is my uncle was over 50 years old. They would not let him leave New Orleans unless my mother was willing to sign for him. Yes. To say that, yes, she is going, you know, he's, he's able to come to our home um, because they were tracking everybody who was leaving New Orleans um, at that time. So, you know, our governments are gonna do things in the name of safety. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying that, that we are looking at technology, we're looking at the business, but we also need to look at the politics of everything as well, because it all works together. Um, and, and people spend millions of dollars. If people are spending millions of dollars to get a Supreme Court justice, you know, put into a position, how much money are they going to spend to control refugees or control us when we have, um, uh, we call it, um, we experience hurricanes and, and natural disasters. Yes. When, when we're going through those things, because usually it's us, it's usually our people that are left behind. Um, you know, other people with resources know how to get out of, of town and have places to go. So um, I, I do want to talk about this in Haiti as well. Uh, a third blockchain initiative of note, meanwhile, was commissioned by Haiti's Ministry of Commerce and Industry and was funded by the World Bank within the framework of a business development and investment project. The aim of the initial pilot scheme, which kicked off in the first quarter of 2019, was to use a private blockchain-based transparent trade ledger in order to level the playing field for about 600 small farmers trying to sell their mangoes, avocados, and pineapples into developed markets such as the United States. The idea was that the R3 quarter-based system, which went live in May, um, would ensure producers were paid the spot price for their fruit based on the supply and demand rather than negotiation tactics as well as prevent them from being fleeced by intermediaries. A custom-built platform created by a consortium which includes agriculture, blockchain specialist, AgriLedger, food traceability system supplier, SourceTrace, and local training provider, Ecole Superieure de Frontenique de Haiti, uh, now enables consumers to scan the QR code of the fruit they wish to buy to establish which farmer produced it, how it was packaged and transported, and what costs were involved. Authorized and vetted farmers can also view logistics and transaction data via their smartphone or web-enabled device. According to Genevieve Lavelle, AgriLedger's CEO, producers collected 38,000 kilos of mangoes during the period of the pilot project. This yield generated uh, 40,000 in sales, of which the farmers received 68%, a 750% increase in revenue per kilo on years gone by. Next to be added to the list will be coffee and cacao producers. Y'all know I'm a business plan writer. I have another story with this. I have some great stories um, uh, in terms of being a business plan writer, but one of my prospects, I ended up not doing her, her, um, her business plan. She was from, oh, a country in Africa. I can't remember which one right now. I think Benin, but I could be wrong. Um, and she uh, was working with women who had a certain type of local fruit there. And the intermediaries would, would um, take advantage 
of the women farmers there. And then they would sell the, uh, the product overseas to Japan or to Europe for exorbitant uh, amounts of profit. And what she wanted to do was to be able to take out the middleman and to increase the wages of the female agri um, farmers within the specific villages and to uh, still get, actually she was gonna reduce the amount of money that the, uh, the Japanese and the Europeans would have to pay for that specific fruit. And um, they I remember they used the fruit for, for uh, chocolate you know, so it was a pretty, uh, pretty prevalent thing, but it wasn't cacao, it was something else. Um, that's one of the reasons why within Africa and within the islands, why our people are, are suffering as well is because they have to go through these intermediaries. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, this is a 750% increase in the revenue, you know, especially these farmers, that could mean the difference, you know, for generational wealth for, uh, for these farmers here. So I'm gonna to toss it over to the two of you to get your thoughts on this specific project. I would say this is a better project in the sense, again, the business aspects are there. The consortium is definitely a, a better improvement, mm -hmm. even though it's still a, a privatized um, centralization, there's still different actors and different players in it. So they have different, they're bringing different data structures to the mix and also different um, purviews to the mix. So with that, you're getting, you're getting viability. So you're, you know, you're getting the accuracy of having, you know, the agriculture say, this is what the yield was, this is what it is. You know, you're getting to me the accuracy that you're needing, even in this small pilot, which would have to probably be a centralized um, kind of run that way because it would be hard to get different information. But these are the kinds of things that definitely would show proof of concept much more simplistically. And those numbers speak for themselves when you're seeing 750% more. Now we know we're onto something and that like I said, these can be scaled. So not only can these projects be, you know, one-offs, they can be grouped together and that consortium could actually grow the individuals can actually who participate moving it from uh, you know even from i would say privatized to really a public or maybe even a hybrid this is where we could go with that but again just starting off with where and who controls the data how are they using it all of those things still need to be a strong consideration when participating in any of these kind of projects yeah I mean, right. well that that's i mean Felicia, like you said it that's exactly where i was going with it you know my concern about it being a consortium too is, you know, that it's very easy in situations like this for them then to, because they control the access, that they can now lock you out. Correct. If you don't. And, you know, and like we've, and we've talked about that in, in the book club, like studying the book, like, but, and that was a concern that those authors raised up in, in the real business of blockchain when it comes down to consortium is at this point, they concern the access, they can lock you out if you don't play by their rules. Also, then once again, um, and it will be very easy for any one of these farmers now to find themselves in a worse situation if they don't play along. And that's my concern um, with it, where it, it overall, right now, the results look fantastic. I mean, we're looking at 750% increase. Okay, that, that looks fantastic, but I, 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 always want to, you know, think always to the point of eventually, and, and at least you, you mentioned this is a good entry point starting here, but eventually, hopefully it will evolve into a much more of a decentralized um, system with open public roads. And, but everyone's using, everyone's using it. Like we, we've talked about it a long time here that, uh, you know, blockchain, when it comes down to uh, the, the global food supply chain, is just a great use case of just being able to verify provenance of food that has been, uh, you know, handled in a certain way and, you know, it's not contaminated, all of those sort of things. And this one looks like it's, it's, it's working out for them when it comes to it, so. These are proof of concepts, and so they're going to work. I mean, most of the time that we've seen anything where we have the ability to aggregate the data, and make it 
you know, it's a stagnant thing. You can't just say on Tuesday, it's $4 on Friday, it's $3. Like that's what happens in here where you have the consistency of the information at each and every stand, we're gonna have to see that. But at the point it has to evolve, the system has to evolve. The data can stay the same. Mm -hmm. It's just how we're utilizing it. And that's really where these, you know, different organizations that participate and really what they're doing, that has to be the business aspect. How are we taking this information? What do we do with it? How do we parse this information? All of that is really their job. The tech is going to do what the tech is going to do each and every single time. So it doesn't matter. But that, I think the organizational aspect, and I would say that's the hardest part. How are we going to do it? We know how it works in the back end. So that's just a no brainer. But how do we get all these participants? How do we prevent people from being locked out? How do we change? What happens if we do bring cacao in or coffee in and is it at a different rate? And how do we get to monitor that? Maybe we start to trade with different providers. Maybe we go to different countries. How do we aggregate you know, Australian coffee from African coffee? Right. All of those things are business processes that really need to be thought of well in advance before you just slap, you know, a blockchain onto it and be like, okay, we have a solution. You really just have something functioning. To me, it's like a calculator versus a computer. Yeah. You can you can add all day long, but are you really using the pure functionality of all the capabilities that it can do? True. And that's what we need to do. We need to really consider all those projects under that purview. True. Hey, hey, Ashree. Do you mind putting that article back up one more time? Because it was something that sure. I wanted to cover in that article. It, it's at the very, it's the very end of that paragraph that the author said that I was like, oh, it's something we, it's the very end. It's the last paragraph. My take, okay, right there, my take. So. <laughs> Okay, my, it's amazing how applying a bit of imagination to the use of technology, whose first incarnation was purely as a tool for generating money, can make all the difference in people's lives when trying to solve some of the world's most intractable problems. This is what the okay. author says. This is what I need everyone to start understanding, especially a lot of like the, the Bitcoin maximalists who kind of say, no, no, it's only going to be one thing, that's it. The rest of the stuff is crap, you know, and then that sort of thing like that, like, like, stop. That's not as, as we as human beings take this technology and bend it and shape it and move it and create things on it. You need to be open to that because you will be able to call the, to just um, use it in a different way beyond what the intention of Satoshi was. Um, so I, I, that's just my take on it like that. Like that really stood out to me because I'm like, yes, this is something I think we, you know, we talk about quite a bit here um, on that. So that was it. I'm always going to say intent has no aspect of optimization. Mm -hmm. The internet was not created with e-commerce in mind. If we always go back to that, it was never meant for that purpose. Yet here we are and we're using it light years past what we initially of little chat protocols and email. Mm -hmm. We can't go back. As I said, your intent, while well-meaning and great, has no bearing on the optimization of something when somebody wants to use your technology. That is just the end of it. Like I said, you can use a knife to cut or you can use a knife to stab. It's really, your intent doesn't really matter at that point. It can do those things because it has the capability to do those things. And we can't pigeonhole tech is never going to be pigeonholed into just, oh, I thought I, I made it like this and that's how you have to use it. The minute you let it go into the world, your end user will change that for you. That's the first aspect of software design. Just because you made it that way doesn't mean your end user will do that. So absolutely never going to work. You know, the, please, I got to tell you, you know what? You need a quote book. You, 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 you <laughs> a lot of like tweetable moments like that. Like I just wrote that down. It's like, <laughs> Intent has no bearing on optimization. I'm just gonna yeah, like, it just doesn't. You yeah. can't. I mean, it's just like that to me is just it is just so incumbent upon us to look at it that way. And again, from a software developer perspective, we always say that. Like that's just like, yeah, this is what I want them to do. This is mm -hmm. how I want them to go through. And then you end up giving it to the end user and they're clicking wildly and they're like, Oh, I want to do this for you. You're like, that's not that's not what I wanted you to do, but that's the whole point. And that's what happens, I think again, all these white papers and even the Satoshi white paper was really, yeah. really 
phenomenal. And that's, again, that's his opinion and his structure of or the her. process. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Him meaning the, the thing. <laughs> But I think those are what we, we look at. And if we go back, I said, this is where we have history on our side. We can look at the internet. We know where it started. Mm -hmm. We know what happened. We know why it was developed with what intent. And now if we just take a look and say, okay, do you use it that way every single day? Probably not <laughs> anymore. You're using it in a whole host of uh, you know, different myriads of ways. And that's what we really need to think about is the possibility and the optimization. And specifically with blockchain, we know those five pillars need to really be a part of it for optimization. What we're seeing are these one-offs, which truly are not blockchain. They're just, you know, the capability of these things put together. Like you said, the Lego pieces. If I don't have all five Lego pieces, it's not the whole thing. It's just right. a piece. Mm -hmm. And that's the puzzle isn't completed in that sense. And I think that's where we're also sometimes missing is that we got to keep remembering like if we add all these things together I always say like you know when you get the five <laughs> things together that's going to give you a whole different trajectory of what can be possible where these little one-offs are giving you really a lot of strike cap capability but they're not giving you the full bang for your buck True. Yeah. yeah and I do think that um we, we are able to look at the advent of internet 1.0, which was, you know, email and, and basic internet and then internet 2.0 being um, social media. And now we're, you know, the third part of it, which is being, you know, blockchain, um, but also recognizing that that technology curve is no matter what. Any, any kind of new tech still goes through that. So it's up to us to see hey, you know, what's going to be the thing in the next 12 to 36 months and how do we capitalize on it? There were people who caught the Facebook craze. You know, there were people who caught the Instagram craze. There were people who caught the Snapchat craze, Snapchat craze and made money. And then when it died, it wasn't the only basket that they had their, you know, their, their social media. Um, well, those are business models. I think that's those are all business. Yeah. But what I'm, what I'm saying is no matter what, so, so Snapchat is a great example of this. We should not only, we should not put our eggs in one super targeted basket either. Right. Right. Um, right now, things are so fluid. You do want to, I say, pick a niche. I still mean that like smart contracts is an overall niche. However, the use cases coming out of it are, are going to be fluid. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and being careful that we um, we're we're broad enough in our niches and in our majors that no matter what happens, we can still make money. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just think I will say even like with the Vine, Vine started off. So mm -hmm. we went from Vine to Snapchat, you know, we've kind of even mm -hmm. gone from MySpace and what up. But those are really, again, what we're seeing is the front end. Mm -hmm. Those are applications, business models. When you said, you know, when you had Facebook ads, e-commerce came out, mm -hmm. all of that tech has always been here. Mm -hmm. We've been utilizing that tech forever. We wow. just put it together. That's what I'm saying. That's the, the back end looks the same no matter what you're doing. This is, this is the new, the newest advent would be the blockchain because now you've changed the infrastructure. So now the tech mm -hmm. has changed, but all those things we overlay are really business. So that's where the, the mindset has to shift because we can do it. Whatever you come up with, we can make it work, but mm -hmm. you got to come up with it. I can't build something out of thin air. You got to tell me, hey, I'm trying this business model where I'm trying to make a token, but then I want to splice it. And then I want to use a piece of real estate. Mm -hmm. I need somebody to, to tell me that so that I can translate that into a functional spec. So that's where I think really where the majors are, are really looking at really current business models and seeing where we can you know, extrapolate different and new things or overlay certain things, because mm -hmm. that's really where the key is, is how to structure the business. The tech will support itself. Mm -hmm. Amen, and with that, um, I am going to say good night to everybody. Thank you so much, Alicia, Eric, everyone who was here tonight. Hope you enjoyed this week's uh, session of Blockchain Chat. See you next week. Good night, everyone. Thank you good for joining. Everybody.